When I first watched The Walking Dead Season 1, I saw Daryl Dixon and thought, Oh shit, it's the guy from Boondock Saints. This is gonna be awesome. You see, 10 years earlier, my best friend, another gangster movie fan, literally bought a copy of The Boondock Saints on VHS after renting it and then invited me over. We ordered a pizza and he was right on the money. I friggin' loved it. Years later, he ran into Norman Reedus and Sean Patrick Flannery in a Vegas bar. He was lucky enough to uh, maybe get a drink with them and take this pic. He said they were so damn cool about it too. And of course, he rubbed it in my face immediately after. <laughs> this video is dedicated to you, bud. Initially, it was regarded as one of the hottest scripts in Hollywood. Writer-director Troy Duffy got a huge first-time director deal from Miramax. He pissed them off somehow and was almost totally blacklisted from Hollywood. The movie would eventually get made, but distribution took a hit because of the feud with Harvey Weinstein combined with the Columbine shooting. That latter one is as dumb as it sounds since the only connections are a black coat and guns, but it got a super limited release only five theaters for one week but then it exploded in video sales growing a large cult following a sequel would end up coming out in 2009 called all saints day to get me to review that one you're gonna have to donate a lot or put a gun to my head and we always have those rumors that don't die about a third movie or a show an origin show but the director is notoriously difficult to work with so if you're interested i wouldn't hold my breath now, Boondock Saints is a movie that seems like it started out having a message, but then said, F*** it, let's have fun. There's an interesting story structure, there's some wild characters, plenty of slow-mo, and there's a butt plug full of charm. There's nothing deep or overly complex, it's a really easy, simple, basic story with a style that allows you to sit back and not nitpick all the technical flaws and just enjoy it, especially with repeat viewings. Now let's look at what we hate and what we love about the Boondock Saints. The movie begins with an establishing shot of South Boston. Quickly we find ourselves inside a church with the McManus brothers. The religious themes have heavy importance, but they're not at all overbearing. Sean Patrick Flannery plays Connor and Norman Reedus plays Murphy. Solid chemistry. Unless a movie does something cool or interesting with the opening credits, it's a flat out no. Credits at the end are for fans. Credits in the beginning is for Hollywood, sniffing their own asses. They're an eyesore, and they rarely age well. Rule of thumb? In the early 1900s, it was legal for men to beat their wives. As long as they used a stick no wider than their thumb. Holy shit, she's a Twitter Terminator sent back in time from the year 2019 to terminate this movie before it starts. Oh, <laughs> that was close. For real though, that rule of thumb part is bullshit. Yes, years ago, a lot of feminists believed that BS, but it has since been debunked. Less than nine minutes in and we got our inciting incident. The McManus brothers with some locals are threatened by the Russian mob. They are buying the surrounding properties and they want the bar to close early. That by itself is enough to start a fight. Ready to watch a bar brawl, but we transition to the next day. Interest perks, knowing this is all connected somehow, but it's a strange scene and it hooks us. Detective Greenlee is almost always wrong. Here he comes up with this wild ass theory that's very unlikely. The actor does a solid job playing a character that's out there and he's not annoying with it. Enter William fucking Defoe as FBI agent Paul Smeaker, gay as shit and cool as fuck. Agent Smeaker uses a disc man to listen to classical music while piecing the crime scene together. As well as a nice touch for the character, it sets a cool vibe and visual for the viewer. Oh really? I might just be wanting a bagel with my coffee. If you watch the director's commentary track on the Blu-ray, Troy Duffy explains why he wrote William Defoe's character as gay. Guess what? It's not because diversity and representation. I'll sum it up, but part of it has to do with the way it conflicts with the ultra-heterosexual cops. And essentially, they get around that shit. Something taboo for the time, but they grow to admire him for his genius investigator skills and the person he is. And serial crushed by some huge friggin' guy. They're scared, like two little bunny rabbits. So the only thing we can do is put a potato on a string and drag it through South Boston. Thanks for coming out. 
You'd probably have better luck with a beer. Detective Greenlee being wrong repeatedly adds to the playful style to the story. The movie is loaded with moments with similar charm. The brothers turn themselves in after stashing the Russian stuff, and now that we got a tease of the strange crime scene, the story flashes back to the start of the bar brawl. Rocco kicks things off, but they ADR him finishing his sentence after getting smacked in the cocksucker. There's no way he's gonna keep talking through that. Dick! Her face looks like an egg! So that's how he got the butt bandage. I come here to kill you, but now I kill your brother. Okay, Ivan's gonna kill Murphy, so why doesn't he just kill him right here? Zero witnesses, and it's a squatter's building. He brings him outside? Why? Who knows how many people could see or hear it, and then see it. That look. Connor beats on the toilet, and hell yes, you feel it. Seriously, that scene has some weight to it. It's gotta be a real toilet. Oh, I love this shot. I was hella excited the first time I saw this moment. I hate to ruin the vibe, we're having so much fun, but he chips the toilet when he beats on it. I know, it's small, but it's really noticeable. It gets chipped, next shot, it's not chipped. Listen, I appreciate the tiny budget, I think it was only five or six million dollars, so I get it. And there's a butt plug ton of tiny errors that I'm not counting. You can see a guy in one of the shots, you can see a guy that's just throwing the toilet after you already showed us the guy in the air after jumping off the fire escape. And there's tons of other continuity mistakes that will not be flawed. That's not the point of this series. We will focus on the ones that are easy to notice and potentially more distracting. The falling prop doesn't have the main hole and then just a flat top when it hits the guy. It doesn't shatter anything at all like a toilet. Trust me, one flaw is kind. There's like a dozen here alone. Okay, the Russian's gun clearly shoots straight down and not into the side of the dumpster with the bullet hole. <laughs> And yes, yes, the fall is too high. He'd be jacked up way worse than a limp. And don't give me that it broke his fall nonsense. It's too tall. With that out of the way, I friggin' love this scene. Flaws and all. <laughs> but it's okay with me if your friends sleep over. <laughs> <laughs> William Defoe rocks. This scene takes five seconds, but it solidifies their relationship. Rocco made sure, without being asked, to get their necklaces because he knows how important they are to Connor and Murphy. There was supposed to be a dream sequence here, but the budget said, no! so we got this cheesy symbolic baptism. I prefer the very subtle look that they share. It says, something changed. The pager they stole from the dead Russians goes off, directly leading to the next story beat. Connor uses Russian to get info that keeps the story flow smooth. This was set up previously showing the brothers are smart and they speak several languages. <laughs> Ron Jeremy as a mean Elvis. I shouldn't have done that. You're not supposed to tell a guy you gotta kill him no more. Taking all the fun out of the job. Excellent casting. <laughs> I'll have a coke. <laughs> ah, the 1990s. When bad guys can crack racist jokes without offending someone on Twitter. <laughs> Tell me one more. What? I love this look he gives him. Rocco is fantastic. He is consistently great in every scene he's in. It's established that the brothers are poor. However, they steal guns, money, and jewelry off of the Russians. And that explains how they can afford this amazing shopping spree. The money looks terrible though. If I ever win the lottery. 1990 sleek combined with the score this shot is fire uh-huh <laughs> just wanted to cuddle what a fag we know the brothers went to take out the russians well more russians and yet again we cut to the crime scene aftermath and it is enjoyable as hell watching them put it all together and because of the comedic and fun style i'm not gonna flaw the unrealistic forensic procedures william defoe on top of the couch it utilizes that space beautifully is that a sleeping mask with some gunk on it I was gonna flaw Agent Ass Blaster for touching his hair, but they show a cop looking grossed out, blood in his hair still, and it's played purposeful to show his character breaks down the more focused he gets, like his full brain power is on the crime scene breakdown and nothing else. I love what's next, so let's get the flaws out of the way. The McManus brothers, wait, 
Oh shit, I just noticed that. Agent Smeaker is chasing down the McManus brothers. A anyway. <laughs> anyway, they get lost in a vent and they start to fight and here you can see the set and possibly fingers from a crew member. They fall through the ceiling and you can clearly see a wide space that isn't a vent or the vent they were supposed to be in, nor do you see even a little piece of metal like they even tried to fake there being a vent. Also, there isn't anywhere for the rope to get caught up on. However, I still enjoy this moment. The gunshot wounds explode into blobs of blood, slow motion activated, the ropes they argued about saving their asses. Yes, they lean more towards fun than they do realism, but that adds value because you enjoy watching this if it's your fifth time, your tenth time, your twentieth time. Wow, that knife sure is flexible. The sudden black and white here symbolizes how the brothers view what they are doing. It is simply black and white. Evil Blue man. man. Dead man. His damn eyes are twerking. Name one thing you're gonna need the stupid fucking roll for. Their dynamic works. We're good. Yes, we are. There's just enough world building to get why Rocco shows up. First, they scare him, and then they make fun of him, which sets up the next part of the story. <laughs> Nine-bodies genius! And it adds humor. This editing and filming flaw is distracting though, shifting from all three guns in Rocco's face to only two. Now the structure is evolving. At first it was the crime scene fully, and then the crime fully. Now it softly switches from crime scene to crime, back to crime scene, then crime. The story takes a breather to fill Rocco in on the brothers' new vigilante actions, and it does well pulling the viewers in to just have fun and hang out with the three. And then we get one of the most unforgettable scenes. Rocco completely obliterates his girlfriend's pussy. It is And Murphy's reaction is great. I can't believe that just fucking happened. As funny as it is, the gun don't recoil. Nothing needs to be rolled. There's a small scene here, but it shows that they're worried about Rocco's boss sending him in with a six shooter knowing there was nine guys. Listen, you get in there, you start getting a bad vibe, you get the fuck out quick! We're playing with time again, but this time it's between Rocco and the brothers. See, they wait for Rocco. It's a quiet scene. His girlfriend and her friend came home and passed out on the couch, and then. <laughs> Back your shit! Back your shit! He's a ball of freaking crazy. Yeah, the stack of vinyls he grabs changes between takes. It's still a crazy high excitement scene, and it's great he grabs an iron, which will be used later. Stop getting excited, motherfucker! <laughs> I watched this movie numerous times, and I never noticed they hung a picture over the bullet hole, and the blood stains are smeared all over the place. That one background visual is fucking hilarious. <laughs> Who is my cat? I killed your cat, you druggy bitch! Why? I felt it would bring closure to our relationship! I'll shoot myself in the head! You can tell me that cat's name! Yell it like that, you prick! Shit! Your fat ass, Ravy! I can't buy a pack of smokes without running into nine guys, you fuck! <laughs> Now we're excited again, knowing something bad happens, and they lead us into the scene with a cool, smooth contrast compared to his previous freaked out panic state. However, close up blood effects need consistency. This directly influences the story, sending them to a private sex club to whack, uh, poor choice of words, to rub out, oh, to kill me, Elvis. There's playful, charismatic dialogue, building on the bond between the three, teasing each other like brothers and friends. Just trying to be professional with you. You look fucking scary, man. Like I said before, this movie favors a fun style. It is really simple and basic. However, there's no solid, believable reason why they would whack their own. Again, we set up the crime and then transition to the crime scene with the structure still evolving. We glide back and forth more frequently now between crime scene and crime. The titty touch is played for laughs and I think it's filmed properly, showing it in a negative light. I'll tip her! William Defoe is excellent. It's a family prayer. My father's father before him, it's that sort of shit. See? Quick, relevant scene that doesn't beat us in the head or spoon feed us information. 
Now listen, I see El Duce and the Duke as two different nicknames, not a translation mistake cause Duce means the leader. Anyway, embracing the over-exaggerated style, we understand within seconds this is a dangerous threat to our leads. Suppressors are supposed to quiet the bang and greatly reduce the flash, so this doesn't work. It's a cool flashback though, getting the terrified point across, looking good visually, and that stare is the cherry on top. Rocco is already terrified, and the dude's just staring at him. This transition is exciting. House is all shot to shit, car riddled with bullet holes, looking like the Bonnie and Clyde car, and you got multiple handguns in the street. Now things heat up and Agent Smeaker calmly explains what went down based on the evidence, except this time he's right there with them, blending the crime scene with the crime, and in some very cool visual ways. My favorite is the gun hands moment. The whole thing is my favorite, but that one in particular is awesome. So many memorable moments jam-packed into the action, setting up a false sense of security before revealing the big they are fucked moment. Now they're staring at six men with guns drawn. It was a fucking ambush. There was a firefight! Even separated from the action, William Defoe comes close to stealing the show, just with his energy and expressions as the crime scene conductor. Hands down, this is one of the greatest moments in the movie. Not without some flaws. Because you're drawn in by the fun, outrageous, over-exaggerated style, most of the flaws are easily overlooked. The ones that stand out too much though would be the film crew totally reflected in Rocco's sunglasses. Or how about the big threat just runs away, like literally just runs away down the street. And that's probably why they don't show it, because that takes away from how badass he's supposed to be. And it's a cool touch having them spray chemicals on the DNA evidence they leave behind, but it's just too unbelievable that they don't miss any tiny little spots on the leaves or the ground, the walls, I mean somewhere. And add this to the fact that later on, the cops could have just helped destroy the evidence. Maybe they made it so the chemical, I think they use ammonia in the movie, maybe it slows the process down and gives the cops time to destroy the evidence. You get what I'm saying? Detective Greenlee has been wrong every single time. What if it was just one guy with six guns? Until now, and a fried agent sneaker just blows him, br brushes him off. I'm not sure why the editor put this together out of order. It's still an awesome scene. Unfortunately, no. Burning the wounds wouldn't fix it. Now this is a scene that I always see highlighted as a flaw, where you can see Connor's fingers too early, but that's just not true. See, Connor uses his finger to start moving the divider, and then once there's enough room, he sticks his fingers in, through the mesh, slides it down a little bit, goes as far as the mesh can stretch, and then he takes his hand out, puts his hand back in, and slides the divider down again. That's why you see his hand poking in and out. He's sliding that divider to get it all the way open, so he can pull Rocco's big dumb head all the way in, getting him nice and neck deep inside his box. Hmm. Anyway, this is needed to show the agent's conflict. You gotta give him credit because it's done without a dull moment. Unfortunately, we cut right to them at the end of a conversation, and it's a bit jarring. We just needed a small scene where Agent Smeaker gets the call. Then there's a second scene that feels missing, leaving the story flow a touch jarring. Yes, on the phone the brothers mention hitting the boss at home. We're gonna hit Papa Joe tonight, We're in the comfort of his own home. And then the retired mobster lets it out that the boss has all his men at the house. He's got every gun in the city up there. Up his house. Fuck. We only hear that they've been caught. We got them. They tried to get in through the basement. Even a small scene would have been fine. Ominous, walking up to the house. And this doesn't have anything to do with subtlety. This has to do with a jarring story flow. On the flip side, it gets dark and serious quick. <laughs> There's a fantastic death scene. The score pushes in. The slow-mo gets activated without dragging it out. And then they hit you with it. The boss's excuse for leaving though is lame. No! I am going. Deal with it. 
How would El Duce know they are here? Why would he kill those that hired him? If he kills all mobsters, then how does a mobster hire him? Shouldn't the boss be ready and nervous anyway? This could have been handled better just by saying the boss is like, take care of it, man. Different dialogue. Not even a new scene. Uh, how did Murphy get back up? Oh, he said it was Primo Box. Primo Box. Listen, William Defoe, I love you, man. But you make one hideous bitch. I get it, it's a ridiculous joke, so this one's for you. That is some serious dedication. Now this is only my understanding, but when he puts the wig on after killing the sexed starved goon in one of the most disturbing final images a man can have before his life ends, he confirms the wig is on. It's on now. But the meaning flips when reality sinks in. He has embraced the way of the saints and he says, fuck it. It's on now. It is man. It was established earlier that El Duce doesn't kill women or children. And why did the FBI agent dress up as a woman? Well, this gets around him being killed by El Duce and it gets around him being active for the rest of this part of the story. He's simply just knocked out when his character is no longer needed. Send forth the violence. Our fees. Bombshell reveal. Yes, first time director, it's a good job doing an intimate, up close camera shot for this. However, before it transitions to black, why in the world they didn't do a wide shot is beyond me. It almost definitely, without a doubt, would have went down as one of the most iconic images from the Boondock Saints original movie. But you live, you learn. Now, I'm split on the ending. As a fan, I would have preferred if he beats the case using corruption and then is killed celebrating afterwards at a private party with a message still shared out through a witness. Even though this feels a tad rushed, the surprised reveal that the cops are helping put a smile on my face. They're sick of the most evil and corrupt men going free. The end is as over the top as most of the movie, and it clearly works, loved by the fans. Even with my previous criticism, it's still good. The score is fire. I definitely don't hate it. Shall flow like a river. We come full circle and the walk is important because it's showing the two brothers beginning their vigilante journey and then reunited with their father, leading the way, El Duce, translated to leader, coming full circle, finishing their story arc for this part of the movie, signifying until they are wiped out, they will eliminate evil. <laughs> And for an independent movie that isn't an established franchise made from comic book characters, it was set up nicely to have one bomb-ass sequel. Sadly, that's not what we got. And finally, something I thought was cool, having the community talk about whether what the Boondock Saints were doing was right or wrong. A neat little touch that ended the movie and then bled over into the credits. And that is The Boondock Saints, a movie that is unfairly blasted by critics, crying it doesn't have perfect Boy Scout heroes, or a message that highlights a solid moral compass. All I have to say is, go get laid, you punk bitch. The Boondock Saints is fun. It's fun as hell. We should be supporting variety in entertainment. Variety. We can have our deep movies, and then we can have our fun, over-exaggerated, share it with your friend, this is some crazy shit type movie. And that's why the Boondock Saints exploded on home video. This was something different. Removing the Fs from the A's gives us the final score of 71. And if you're new here and you're a huge Boondock Saints fan, relax. The scoring system is different from the normal that you might be thinking from 0 to 100. That's not the case at all. Anything positive is considered above okay. Bad movies will drop into the negatives. So to give you a better perspective, think about negative 100 to positive 100 as your scoring gauge. We do go above 100. I'm just giving you a different perspective because if you're thinking 0 to 100, you're going to be way off. Check out the previously released Train to Busan and stay tuned. Next, 
Bone Tomahawk. Want to help get these released quicker? Join the Map Mob on YouTube or on Patreon. Links will be in the video description. And thank you very much to the following supporters.